Okay, welcome again to the third session of the Conference Sphere of Art. This is something of a marathon, uh, which goes on until tomorrow at 6. Uh, and a thank you to the audience to be here, being here and to the, the panelists who are on the stage. The moderator for today's session is Suzanne Nossel. Suzanne Nossel is the executive director of PEN America, and uh, before that was the executor, executive director of Amnesty International. She has had a long career in defending human rights and particularly particular interest in the rights of, of women around the globe. And it's my great pleasure to introduce her to you and to turn over the mic to her and she will moderate this next session. Thank you, Suzanne. Field, having worked over the years on many different issues from an advocacy perspective, uh, working with tools like op-eds, petitions, congressional testimony, lawsuits. I've often sat with colleagues feeling frustrated as we come to sort of the end of the road, having used all the tools in our toolbox and still realizing that on issues like the death penalty or the closure of Guantanamo or addressing sexual violence that we've made the kind of progress that we've hoped. And we've kind of we've played all of our cards and are not sure what is next. And I think in those cases, uh, what, what can be interesting is how art comes in and whether it can change minds, change the game, offer a new paradigm and a new opening when other avenues seem to be closed. So I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation uh, with two people who come at this issue with very long uh, experience, both uh, as academics and as practitioners. We have uh, with us this afternoon Ricardo Dominguez, who is uh, an American artist and an associate professor of visual arts at UC San Diego. He's been the subject of controversy over a number of acts of electronic civil disobedience, both on his own and with the Electronic Disturbance Theater, which he co-founded. He's organized virtual sit-ins, attempting to overload and crash websites uh, as part of a program called FloodNet. He's also helped develop a phone app called the Transborder Immigrant Tool, and this tool has the, the extraordinary distinction of having received an award from the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, but also being the subject of a congressional investigation. So a great example of, of the love-hate relationship uh, between governments and uh, their artist activists. Uh, he's talked about vi virtual sit-ins as the digital equivalent of the types of civil disobedience championed by Thoreau, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King. We're also joined by Stephen Duncombe, who is associate professor at the Gallatin School and the Department of Media, Culture, and Communications at NYU, where he teaches history and the politics of media. He's the author and editor of six books on the intersection of culture and politics. He's also the creator of Open Utopia, an open access, open source, web-based edition of Thomas More's Utopia. He's a lifelong political activist and co-founded the School for Creative Activism in 2011. He's currently working on a book on the art of propaganda during the New Deal. I'm gonna turn it over to Ricardo first. Thanks so much for being here. Hola, muchas gracias a toda la comunidad. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Voy a hablar en español, así que, no, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you, everybody, for um, inviting me, for seeing longtime friends and uh, being back here in New York. So um, I'll try to go through um, a little bit of early work going back to the 80s that lead up to the work in, in the 90s in terms of electronic disturbance theater, and then look at the work that I'm doing at UCSD Cal IT2, Bang Lab, Bits, Atoms, Neurons, and Genes, and uh, what came out of that. 
and, and this sort of constellation between the administration of fear, um, fear of art, and a way to navigate those discussions around the aesthetics of disturbance, and perhaps later on what sort of conversations come from that uh, particular uh, uh, aesthetic of disturbance. So if you'll bring up the um, PowerPoint. So I'll start back in the 1980s, Tallahassee, Florida. This is Critical Art Ensemble. Um, this was the first album we did, um, Quit Work, uh, which we accomplished. Uh, over there you see uh, uh, Steve Kurtz, who was under investigation by Homeland Security uh, around 2002 for bioterrorism. Next to him, uh, Hope Kurtz, poet, uh, uh, myself, then Dorian Burr, photographer, and Steve Barnes, one of the first people who actually touched a computer in the 80s. And a critical ensemble was an important zone in terms of establishing uh, this aesthetic of disturbance, uh, trying to think about a relationship between uh, radical art practice um, in the cultural frontier of Tallahassee, Florida. One of the first uh, endeavors to establish a performative matrix was to create gestures that would disturb the condition of what we called the exit culture. In this case, it was a Tallahassee uh, mall or a bunker of commodities. And I wanted to create gestures that were shareable. Anybody could do this type of gesture. And so I would go into a mall. Uh, I would buy uh, $10 worth of things. And instead of going into uh, my home quietly, opening my fetishes, I just break them out right there. And instantly, the security guard and community would gather. Was it a homeless person, a crazed Vietnam vet? I would never say anything, but these micro gestures would create a disturbance in which perhaps uh, we could take a measure of power around uh, something like a mall. Uh, we also did handmade books of poetry at this time, hypertext uh, using utopian plagiarism. Um, and often when I encounter uh, administration and official now, uh, officials now, they often say that uh, my use of poetry uh, is camouflage, but I always go back to these handmade books of uh, a desire to literally touch uh, poetry. Uh, one of the important encounters for Critical Art Ensemble in the 80s was that many of our friends began uh, to die, and we were deeply moved by the work of Grand Fury, Group Material, and many other artists uh, who were trying to let theory hit the ground. Um, so we started doing gestures called cultural vaccines, uh, which endeavored to bring uh, groups like uh, Grand Fury and community in Tallahassee, Florida, from kindergartners to punks, to have dialogues around what this particular issue was, what it meant, uh, the fear uh, that was uh, around uh, this particular unnamed disease uh, at that particular point. I did a lot of blood work at that point because fluids were considered uh, a site of uh, danger, a site of risk, and, and certainly there was a lot of fear that came with doing uh, gestures that revolved around blood. So a lot of the time I had to negotiate how far people were uh, from me. Uh, since the gesture here at the end uh, of critical virus number six was to uh, take my blood out and, and let it spill to the ground. Um, and certainly it, it allowed me to consider the kind of institutional dialogues, uh, um, both in informal spaces and formal spaces around uh, fear of the body and its fluids. Uh, here uh, we started ACT UP uh, uh, Tallahassee. Uh, here are some of the uh, early posters that we did. Tallahassee's the capital, of course. We were working with ACT UP Miami and ACT UP Atlanta, but we were really influenced by ACT UP Golden Gate, uh, who established uh, community research initiatives. And this idea of a community research initiatives, what we might call citizen science now, uh, became important in establishing some of the configuration that I work with at the university level now. And that's an image of one of the cultural vaccine projects 
uh, there. Uh, what came out of this was a series of writings, one called The Electronic Disturbance, uh, another one called Electronic Civil, Dis uh, Civil Disobedience and Other Unpopular Ideas. Uh, during the 80s, we began to explore what the relationship was between data bodies and real bodies. Uh, that in the 90s, we would begin to see an assemblage, a gathering of virtual capitalism in the early 90s. We would then see the emergence of genetic capitalism since the Human Genome Project would emerge, and later, by the end of the 90s, particle capitalism. Uh, as you remember, in the, in the 80s, nanotechnology was becoming uh, to the foreground. So these were areas that we thought we could disturb, uh, and obviously, uh, defining uh, electronic civil disobedience as a theory and practice was going to be a necessary thing uh, as we moved into the 90s. Um, one of the things that was really important when I came to New York in, uh, in the early 90s was finding infrastructure, finding computers to really establish a cyber poetics for electronic civil disobedience. Uh, the RAND Corporation in 1991 wrote, uh, Cyber War is Coming. They were really praying for an electronic Pearl Harbor very early on, and they defined cyber terrorism, cyber war, and cyber crime, but they never mentioned something like electronic civil disobedience. And I found Wolfgang Stela of Thing.net, a conceptual artist who established infrastructure as a public sculpture, if you will. And uh, working with Wolfgang, I was able to uh, develop uh, the practice of electronic civil disobedience. Uh, Thing.net was an internet service provider for artists and activists that still host a lot of electronic civil disobedience. One of the things that occurred to me was that cyber poetics would be extremely important in defining uh, the disturbance of uh, electronic civil disobedience in the face of this threesome. Um, uh, and uh, one of the elements for uh, cyber poetics was uh, to develop minor simulation embedded in the real, that is real situation, and against a liminality, a code switching between simulation and the real as uh, the establishment of what electronic civil disobedience should be. Uh, then working with the Zapatistas in 1994, one minute after midnight, as the uh, NAFTA, the free trade zone, uh, was cobbled together and signed off, the Zapatistas emerged one minute after midnight in Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, instantly, the next day, they created uh, the first social network, uh, what is called Digital Zapatistas. Uh, the New York Times called them the first postmodern revolution. And they really uh, gave the ground uh, for what would become the practice of electronic civil disobedience, uh, establishing uh, a community um, that was both networked and not networked. Uh, again, a liminal space of disturbance. Uh, with uh, that in mind, uh, I co-founded Electronic Disturbance Theater. Uh, with uh, a group of people uh, over there in glasses is Brett Stahlbaum. He was a new media artist in San Jose, California. Next to me is Carmen Karasik, a new media artist and a bug hunter up at MIT, uh, who happened to be my system administrator during a uh, show that I was doing up there um, around digital zapatismo. And then uh, Stefan Ray, who was a scholar at University of Texas Austin, who did early research on information war and the drug war in Mexico. Uh, this is uh, the Zapatista flood net, as it was originally done. It used uh, qualities of the uh, basic structure of the internet at that time, or a browser, uh, which is the reload function and a 404 function, um, which you could upload 404 files into the Mexican government's website. Things like, it does just as exist at the Mexican government website. The Mexican government website will respond, uh, justice does not exist on this server. <laughs> Democracy does not exist. We weren't cracking into the system. We were just indicating what was missing from the system. Uh, an important condition. The reload was based on the amount of people who participated. And thus we created a, an intimacy between data bodies and real bodies. We established a radical transparency saying we, uh, Electronic Disturbance Theater, uh, Brett Stahlbaum, Common Karasik, um, Stefan Ray, myself, we live in Williamsburg. You can come find us, uh, whomever you uh, are, Mexican government, and we're happy to speak to you. There was nothing hidden about the code or the process or when things would happen. Um, 
In terms of fear of art, uh, one of the first major actions against us was by the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, we were doing a virtual sit-in against the Pentagon, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, and the Mexican government. Uh, the DOD launched the first known information war weapon at us. Uh, everybody knew they had information war weapons, uh, but nobody had ever seen it. And this was a front page review by the U.S. Department of Defense. If the electronic disturbance theater wasn't illegal, it was certainly immoral, which brings us into the sphere of um, fear of art. Uh, that is that the fear of art isn't about the question of legality or illegality, but a question of ethics and justice. Uh, this is the Zapatista tribal port scan that we did at the border hack in 2000 in Tijuana. What we did is we uploaded poetry into the servers of the border patrol in the US. Uh, they said it was illegal, it was the beginning of cracking, but we felt that sharing Zapatista poetry was an important space of cultural interchange. Uh, the next action that we did in Germany was against Lufthansa. It was a deportation class action where they would take immigrants, uh, mummify them, and several of them died uh, during the Lufthansa deportation. Uh, what was important about this action was that uh, one of the few legal cases around electronic civil disobedience occurred after this. In 2004, uh, uh, one of the uh, host administrators of the action in Germany was arrested in 2004 for cyber terrorism. The lower court said it was cyber terrorism, uh, but then the higher court overturned it and said it was civil disobedience and should be treated as such. Uh, of course, Anonymous and another generation have taken up electronic civil disobedience, somewhat different than what we have done or are doing, but uh, sometimes they do share uh, some of the questions. Now electronic civil disobedience is part of the pedagogical uh, space uh, in many uh, uh, universities. I was hired in 2004 for doing all this by Cal IT2, California Information Technology at UCSD. And one of the first gestures I did, going back to the original micro gesture, was just to go to the border, stand with my branded UCSD shirt, looking at the Pacific with a utopian vision, and immediately the border patrol showed up. One cannot be happy and look at the future near the border. Um, so micro gestures, one doesn't have to do very much to create fear of art. Um, in 2004, I established Bang Lab Bits, Atom Neurons, and Genes. It was to focus on electronic civil disobedience and hacktivism, border disturbance art, and nanopoetics, nanotoxicology. Uh, first action was against uh, um, uh, the Minutemen. Then we developed the transporter immigrant tool, um, which carries a, a question of changing global poetics. I uh, mean, global positioning system, the global poetics. This is Brett Stalbum again, Amy Sarah Carroll, poet, uh, Ellie Mormad, uh, a new media artist, and Misha Cardenas and myself. Um, it created a lot of havoc that is offering sustenance to undocumented immigrants as to where they could find water and poetry. Um, this created a lot of problems, and so I'm going to show you um, a video that will sort of bring all of this together. And um, I'll end here up. Oh, let's try it again. Nate Ricardo, actor, agitator, artist, theorist, and one of activism's founding fathers. When I came to New York in 1991, what I was looking for was a platform that would allow me to create uh, a space for electronic civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is nonviolent direct action online. It follows the theory of uh, Thoreau in On Civil Disobedience that was then developed by Gandhi, Martin Luther King, ACT UP during the 80s, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. We never destroy a server, uh, we never change anybody's web page, we never uh, hijack their uh, name or domain name. 
Ricardo Dominguez and his electronic disturbance theatre were among the first to heed the call. Really, uh, what is a Zapatista is those who can uh, take into their heart the poetic gestures. The, the gestures of information war, which uh, cross the boundaries of what is. For instance, on January 3rd, 2000, uh, newspapers around the world had Zapatista Air Force attacks Mexican military. Nobody knew the Zapatistas even had planes. Nobody even knew the Zapatistas could fly. But if you read the story, suddenly you discover that these uh, Zapatista Air, uh, Air Force were paper airplanes made of many different colors. Inside were messages of peace. So what the soldiers were shooting at were these paper airplanes. And there you have this enactment of a simulation of a gesture which creates this magical space uh, where indeed there does exist a Zapatista Air Force. Because what you're trying to get out is what the Zapatistas say is information war. That is, words as war, not words for war. Inspired by the Zapatistas' ideas, Ricardo and his crew launched their flood net tool as the paper aeroplane of cyberspace. Heat exhaustion produces sweating, clammy skin, increased pulse and respiration rate, weakness, more fainting, nausea and vomiting. Stop. The choices you make will dictate whether you live or die. Uh, the genesis of this project, Transborder Immigrant Tool, is really uh, Water Stations Inc. and uh, Border Angels and other groups that maintain water caches in the desert for immigrants who are crossing. So if you feel you're lost, you don't know where you are, and you need water, you turn this on. One of the basic uh, core trajectories of Banglab, bits, atoms, neurons, and genes, uh, was to explore the issue of border disturbance technologies. It's not going to lead you over the landmass. Uh, it's not going to lead Al Qaeda uh, over the landmass to Phoenix. Uh, it's a last mile safety tool. So, Adam has identified uh, perfect. one or more sites that may be within walking distance. Evaluate your situation. Check the distances on the screen. There may be obstacles, including your own fatigue that prevents travel in the direction that the compass indicates. And what it says on the screen right now is that there's a site direction south and that it's three kilometers. And it gives an approximate. Oh, well, a disturbance occurred. <laughs> <laughs> the Latin. Mexican government. Uh, yeah, the Mexican government is everywhere. So you get the general idea. <laughs> Oh, hello. <laughs> um, so I'm Steve Duncan, and this afternoon I want to talk about the fear of the efficacy of art. So in addition to being a professor at NYU and a lifelong activist, I, along with conceptual artist Steve Lambert, co-direct something called the Center for Artistic Activism. Sure. Is that better? No. <laughs> Can you make it louder? Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. We're going to do Oprah style. OK. Um, at the center, we do research on activist art. And we travel across the country and around the world training activists to think a little bit more like artists and to train artists to think a little bit more activists. So we're deeply invested in this idea of activist art. But there's a question which haunts us and a question which haunts the entire practice, which is, does it work? And I once had the chance to pose this question to Hans Hacke, who probably most of you know, um, and present company excluded, um, is arguably the finest activist artist alive today. So I asked him, as an activist artist, how do you know when what you have done actually works? To which he replied, I've been asked that question many times, and that question requires one to go around it before one really avoids it. <laughs> now, his reply is obviously meant to be funny, right? But in interviewing dozens of talented and sophisticated artistic activists, and in surveying nearly a thousand examples of activist art, I'm struck by the recurring inadequacy 
of the conceptualization of the relationship between artistic activism and demonstrable social change. Now, this difficulty in conceptualizing and articulating the relationship is understandable. For art and activism are very strange bedfellows. That is, they do different work in the world. Activism, simply stated, is an action that aims to have a demonstrable effect. Art, equally simply stated, is a gesture that aims for an expressive affect. Now, these might seem at odds with one another, but in fact, they're complementary. Contrary to classical democratic and economic theory, we don't make rational choices based on reasoned deliberation with full access to information. As any seasoned activist can tell you, and as recent developments in cognitive science have actually confirmed, people are moved to change their mind. They're moved to act. And as such, we have to start thinking about affect as something which leads to effect. Or we might want to think of this as affective effect or effective affect, whichever way you want to go. Um, which then employing the archaic grapheme ash, we might call this. Uh, and I just invented this word, um, and I realize sitting here, I've never actually said it out loud. Um, so here we go, we're gonna christen it I-effect, or I-effect. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, what I wanna do in the few minutes allowed to me today is not to suggest there's one way that activist art works, or one criteria of a a a efficacy. Um, Okay, that's going to be tough. Okay, efficacy. Um, other critics have argued that the function of activist art is, quote, the defunctionalizing of the status quo, or the making of agonistic spaces, or the fostering of dialogic art. And there's nothing wrong with these objectives. In fact, there's a lot right with most of them. But my aim here is both much more humble and much more ambitious. For I'm not here to tell you what activ art, activist art does, or should do, or must do. Rather, I'm interested in what activist artists want their art to do. Because once we have some clarity here, we can begin to develop a methodology for determining whether they have succeeded. And there it is, the ugly word. The word that brings terror to every artist, which is metrics. And there's a good reason that this word brings terror to artists immediately it brings up this idea of someone calculating art in some cubicle someplace wearing a gray flannel suit. But I think it's a little bit disingenuous because actually artists apply metrics to their work all the time. That is, they can be metrics of commercial success or institutional success or critical success. And an artist internalize these criteria of success so thoroughly that they're often not even aware that they apply them to their own work. These metrics become such a part of the culture of the artist that they're largely invisible. And as artistic activism has become more popular and funding from nonprofit organizations has become more available, other metrics have been applied to the practice, engendering what Nairobi-based artist Sam Hopkins, among others, have called the NGO aesthetic. <laughs> so what I want to say here is that the question of metrics is not a matter of yes or no, but rather which and whose. So the first step in crafting a methodology for efficacy is to be clear about aims. That is, what work do we want our art to do? Now this seems really obvious. Of course you need to know what you want to do in order to determine if you've actually done it. But my experience as a researcher, trainer, and practitioner has demonstrated over and over again that this simple process is rarely undertaken any, with any rigor when it comes to activist art. Activist artists give a lot of thought to how they want their piece to look or sound, their technical aims or their mastery of their medium, but they give far less thought to what success means at a social or political level. Nonetheless, from extensive interviews and anal analysis, I've arrived at the following sort of set of what social scientists call ideal types. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, and I don't have time to actually explain any of them. You will see, however, create disruption up there, which I think Ricardo was just talking about. But all of these aims of activist art and more tend to point in four major directions, which I think are interesting to think about. The first is imminent ideological shift. That is, an immediate impact on the way people think about an issue or a concern. For example, 
moving the needle on public opinion about racial, racial profiling by the police. Or it can be the idea of ultimate ideological change, which is a long-term effect on the way people think. That is, perhaps, getting the population to realize that black lives matter. Or even farther reaching, a shift in perspectives, a change in common sense, what Jacques Ranciere refers to as the redistribution of the sensible. And then there's Im Im imminent material impact, which is an immediate, visible, physical effect on the world. And this can be as simple as getting more people to attend a community meeting on policing, or more ambitious, like halting the police practice of stop and frisk. And finally, ultimate material result, which is a material, often structural result over the long haul. And examples of this might be new trainings for police officers, new civilian review boards, an end to the prison industrial system, or even as far reaching as creating a new state or no state at all. Again, these aren't mutually exclusive aims and one may follow from another. For example, in an ideal democracy at least, where public opinion has weight, ideological change may be necessary for material impact. But once we know what we're aiming at, then the next question is, did we actually hit our target? Now, if our objective is to build community, then are there, whoops, then are there groupings of people with shared sets of practices and values that didn't exist before our intervention? If our objective is to foster dialogue, then did we observe people talking about our peace and its concerns? Was our peace picked up by the media? Did that stimulate further discussion? What sorts of discussions ensued? If our objective is imminent material impact, then the proof's in the pudding. Did it have a visible physical result? After our intervention, did more people show up at a meeting than before? Was a law passed? And if our objective is imminent ideological shift, then it makes a certain logical sense to sample public opinion. Advertisers do this, politicians do this, why shouldn't we? We might want to ask our intended audience what they thought about police profiling before experiencing our piece and then again after. Was there some sort of a change? Once we have all these variables accounted for, the formula is quite simple. If achieved affect ma matches desired affect, then we've succeeded. If it doesn't, we've failed. And if achieved affect comprises a fraction of desired affect, then we're on the right path. Expressed as a mathematical formula, it might look something like this, where S is equal to delta sub A over delta sub D, where S is success, and delta sub A is achieved state minus initial state, and delta sub D is desired state minus initial state. And if we're aiming towards multiple targets, in a campaign, for instance, we might set X different goals and measures and find the average success over them all. And that formula would look something like this. And there we have it, the formula for successful activist art. <laughs> not really. Um, well, not completely really, okay? At times, with relatively straightforward objectives that can be easily measured, like increasing the number of people showing up at an organizing meeting, you might be able to use a formula like this. But such easily quantifiable objectives are few and far between. And I offer this as a metaphor rather than mathematics, as a heuristic tool to get us thinking about the affect of activist art. Because art is wonderfully irrepressible. It is forever producing affects and effects that we did not predict or even desire. One might argue that this is actually its strength. Art, if it's any good, is always creating a surplus, bubbling up and slopping over the sides of whatever categories we've created to contain it, spilling out onto the floor, making new forms and patterns that demand new perspectives to understand and new measures to judge. Some of the affects of our artistic activism may not be discernible, not in the short run, or, may, or not even in our lifetimes. Mass changes in sense perception or bodily patterns, for instance. How would we possibly judge the success of, say, Ranciere's redistribution of the sensible, which, if we actually are successful, will have created entirely new criteria for success and measurement? We probably can't, and that's okay. And we need to make peace with that. Artistic activism, when all is said and done, is an art, not a science. There's no singular way to determine it works, nor a formula to determine 
if it has worked. Acknowledging this, however, does not allow us to retreat into a sort of magical thinking, whereby we create a peace and poof, expect something to happen. And yes, this is the cover to a Pink Floyd album. So my collaborator, Steve Lambert, puts it this way. The practice of activist art is like a prism. You shine a light in, which we might call sort of artistic activist intent or purpose. But what comes out is a spectrum of affect. And this is not something we can entirely control for. However, if that beam of light that is going into the spectrum is not focused, if our intent is weak and diffuse, we won't have any rainbows. We may not have, nor want, the metrical formula that can be applied to all artistic activism. But if we're to take activist art seriously, if we believe truly that art can change the world, we always need to be clarifying our purpose by asking ourselves the questions of what work do we want activist art to do, and how will we know if it works? An objection. I know you're thinking this. Doesn't all this thinking and planning about affective effect and effective affect run counter to the ineffable, sublime quality of great art? That is, isn't considering metrics a recipe for bad art? And it's a valid objection. But I think such concerns presuppose that aesthetics and politics are not connected. And I reject that division. They're intimately connected not just on a grand theoretical plane, that what we consider aesthetically pleasing is, in fact, determined by larger social, historical, and political forces, although this is certainly true, but on a very base, pragmatic activist level. Bad art makes for bad activism. Without the power to attract and move our audience, activist art is useless. Art that is an aesthetic failure will also fail in its mission to change people's hearts, change their minds, and thus change the world. Activist art that doesn't move us leaves us standing still. Thank you. Thanks very much to both of you. I'm gonna ask you to pick up the mics for the conversation. I think people hear us better that way. Just to sort of start it off, um, it's very interesting listening to both of your presentations kind of through the lens of someone who has approached activism uh, through legal and advocacy techniques. And I'm curious to what degree, you know, there's a whole language of evaluating impact, uh, theories of change, outputs and outcomes that, you know, is a parallel in some ways to what you've outlined that one might, what one, in terms of what one might measure uh, to evaluate art as activism. And I'm wondering to what degree your interventions have been coordinated with other kinds of advocates and how that interaction has played out. Is it an easy one? Is it difficult? Are you talking entirely separate and unintelligible languages? And is that coordination something that's, that's necessary? Should there be more of it? Love your reflections. Um, well, I'll look at a particular case. For instance, with the transporter immigrant tool, um, I always work with a kind of an anarchist five. Um, um, mostly it's always has been artists with the exception of Stefan Ray with electronic disturbance theater uh, during the 90s. So when we established that we could create an algorithm in a cheap cell phone, um, it was important to me that experimental poetry be a part of it. Uh, we often uh, want to think about um, uh, undocumented immigrants as being bare life here to take our jobs, but not as sort of culturally intelligent human beings. And so I thought the most radical poetry possible would be useful as a type of sustenance. So when the tool was finally ready, we contacted Border Angels and Water Station Inc., who have, uh, for the since 2000, uh, established um, water. Uh, there in the Anza Borrego area in Southern California. And so uh, we needed uh, the locative waypoints of where the water was for the algorithm to work. And so uh, when we presented uh, the gesture, um, first they, they didn't think it would work, i.e. as a tool, 
too, they had a lot of conflict of why poetry, poetry that was not a lyric eye poetry, was part of the tool. And so it took about a year of dialogue in terms of thinking about the border as an aesthetic project and, and this uh, availability of a different formation of, uh, of language, of the aesthetics and disturbance. Uh, but finally, um, working with them, going out on Sundays, on Saturdays, putting water out, uh, we were able then to coalesce with these communities uh, and have them begin to think about art in relationship to their work as a way to amplify uh, their work. Um, so uh, it, I think it's, our, our projects are always durational. It takes about 10 years from concept to implementation to sort of a space to think about it. And I think uh, often because of the urgency of many actions, right, we have to take a tactical approach. So the long-term durational dialogue or, or conversation is, is somewhat more difficult. So I think part of the answer of, of good activist art is sort of a long-term conversation with the activists uh, around the issue of, of art uh, in relationship to what they do. Yeah, I mean, most of the work we do is much more um, directed, working with activists, actually in very short time periods, which is unfortunate, but we find them actually to be very interested in figuring out how to use art, but use art as one tool in a greater toolbox, um, which they apply. For example, we we're just in Barcelona working with access to medicine activists, and these are people who are just amazing at um, community mobilization, legal strategies, and political strategies and electoral strategies. Um, and none of this, and we, we, we reinforce this, is saying none of this new stuff which we will help you develop is in replacement for that. It's just an added tool. When you've run out of everything else, as you said, what else can we do? We can do this. But also, as anybody who actually works with a toolbox knows, once you have a new tool in your toolbox, you think about all these new jobs you can actually do with that tool. And so while we often think about activist art on a tactical level, what's interesting about working with activists is developing sort of forms of creativity and creative process where they start thinking differently about their strategies and also their goal setting and even their organizational structure. And I think that sort of fruitful interchange between artists and activists um, is, is absolutely necessary. Do you have an example of that where sort of the artists got the lawyers to maybe think differently? Well, I think in this case, um, Certainly what we do is we do a lot of work getting lawyers um, to actually think about the dream image, the utopia that they want to bring into being. Because lawyers and activists often get very stuck on the immediate. For example, what do we want to do? We want to pass House Resolution Bill 327. And they focus in on that. And then they get very frustrated when no one else wants to pass House Bill you know, number 327, right? And so we do a lot of work with them thinking about, well, what's beyond that? What happens after you win? And after that, and after that, and leading them to the place which is the world that they want to bring into being, which is what artists do all the time, is they conjure up impossible visions of a world. And then we backtrack from there. Because it's those impossible visions which actually motivate not just the activists, but the people that they're trying to appeal to. I'd like to say we invented it, but this is how advertising works. Um, advertising never sells shampoo by saying it's going to make your hair marginally <laughs> cleaner. It says it has this wonderful vision of like, you know, sex and power and all of this. And then you get shampoo. They're unethical because no amount of shampoo is going to get you that, okay? But actually passing HR Bill 327 will get you closer to this utopia. But they, they need to move to that place. And so sort of creative thinking about goal setting is actually a very useful tool. I want to go back to your comment about uh, the aesthetic evaluation here. I mean, you you had uh, you you said bad art never equal uh, equals bad activism, but does good art equal good activism necessarily? And when you have a successful example of art as activism, I mean, does that necessarily mean it was good art? Should it be evaluated by pure aesthetic standards, or are those in a sense 
not relevant if it achieves something. Right. Certainly, um, there's lots of good art which has nothing to do with activism. And I think that's totally OK, OK? I think I'm interested, and I think Ricardo's interested, in activist art. That is, art that does have some sort of transformative power in the world, to disturb it, to create something new, and what have you. Um, and so I would argue that in order to have that transformative power, it has to have some sort of aesthetic quality in order to move us, to make me feel something, to make me imagine something, to disturb me in a way that opens up a space. Um, and so I think that if you go back through history, if you want to look at when art has been effective, okay? And I want to think about the art of the protest, and I want to think about the art of the sit-in, because I think those were artful gestures. It's actually those moments that actually do have an aesthetic quality. Well, I was going to say that a lot of, uh, of the work that we do is maybe anti-anti-utopian in that it creates a, a kind of not trying to let the lawyers or the authorities, the FBI, what have you, think of a utopian moment or to come, but to find themselves in the utopian moment where art matters. So for instance, uh, with the Transporter Immigrant Tool, UCOP, University uh, of California Office of the President, the FBI, Congress, all these individuals swarmed on Bang Lab and said this is illegal or what have you. Uh, but what happened was that because we code switched uh, between uh, what they came in terms of their legal, you broke the law, you did this, right, which is sort of an empirical mathematical law, we said, no, this is about art, and you should read these poems and tell us which poems you like best. Because this is not about uh, global positioning systems, this is about a geopoetic system. So we had several cases where we had the FBI reading the poetry. Um, <laughs> We had accountants, we had lawyers, uh, and so they could no longer speak about the question of laws broken, but about the question of art that the, perhaps they feared or, or what art they liked. So it really became a question of their aesthetic choices, right? And, and there were often cases where, for instance, the FBI said, is this poetry encrypted? <laughs> and I said, well, I've read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and I believe poetry is encrypted. Um, so there you, and so for instance, the lawyers that were working with us suddenly had to no longer speak about certain issues. They had to speak about Duchamp. They had to speak about new media art. They had to speak about conceptual art. They had to speak about uh, radical poetry, which is not what they expected to speak about, right? They expected to, to, to look at the aesthetics of laws broken. Um, or laws imagined. So this anti-utopian anti space of fear of art is to bring these dis desperate communities, antagonistic and, and supportive, into a dialogue about what art is, even if they don't want to have that dialogue. I wonder if you've ever tried that in court. Uh, <laughs> well, let me ask you about one example, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Pussy Riot comes to mind. You know, uh, protesters, they got characterized as a punk band, but they weren't actually a band. They had no musical pretensions. Not that they, that ever stopped a punk rock band, speaking yeah. as an ex-member of a punk rock band. But what would you say about uh, their ability to shape the conversation and, ha and, and an assessment of their aesthetics and the, the quality of their, their work or their out artistic output and how those two Mesh. Well, again, is aesthetics isn't something fixed. It's always contingent. Um, and so what they were working on is an aesthetics of punk rock. In so far as, in terms of an aesthetic terrain which they set up, which was the aesthetics of disruption, it actually worked quite well. And so I think that when, you know, I don't know if anybody's been, been talking about aesthetics, you know, in some sort of idealized form since Kant. Um, we're always talking about how are we going to define what is aesthetically pleasing and what is not. Interestingly enough, I was just at this uh, recently giving a talk at the Smithsonian who wanted to bring in actually uh, punk rock aesthetics, punk rock stuff. And I said, you're going to have a real hard time because the best of this stuff is actually the stuff that doesn't work very well. Really, the best of it is the stuff that anybody can do. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Let me ask a different question. Uh, in this, I, well, no, I think it, I think it does. 
uh, but I still wonder whether you whether need to say their art was good in order right. to acknowledge that their art had an impact. Well, I think maybe you reverse the, and this is, I think, what your original question was, is since it did have an impact, can we then go back and say their art was good, okay? And I think what we can say at that moment is since it had an impact, and if it was the impact which they desired, then it was an effective mobilization of an aesthetic. Right. I mean, whether or not that equals good art in a form. Well, but the thing is, is the idea of what is good art changes when we start thinking about activist art. Right, and I don't even know if they would say they're artists. I, I don't know how if they would self-identify as artists. They might, uh, but they, you know, I think fundamentally, having spoken to at least the husband of one of the members, you know, they really see themselves as activists first and foremost. Art, uh, you know, or videos, uh, dressing up, demonstrations in a church as a tool, uh, you know, a, a tool that looks like art, but whether they actually would, would call it art themselves, I don't know. Well, I mean, they, a number of the Pussy Riot members were a part of an earlier group of conceptual artists who did lots of gestures. So I, I would certainly look at their work as part of this history of work that was being done. Um, I think often what happens is that uh, with kind of artivist gestures, one then enters into the negotiations that are expected and unexpected. Um, and out of that expected is that one wants to make a manifestation, one wants to amplify certain questions, uh, uh, bring them to the foreground, and then one is put in a, in a position where one can't do that. And I think what happened with Pussy Riot was that they then started looking at the prison complex. Uh, and, and so here, this kind of art of his history uh, uh, mobilized them to reconsider an unexpected place uh, because they had to live through it. Um, and what will be interesting, I think, is to what degree that history of artivism uh, may or may not participate in this kind of new level of amplifying uh, the activist work of, of critiquing and trying to change um, the prison complex in Russia, and I would imagine probably on a global scale, is probably part of their utopian thinking as well. So I think artivism sometimes uh, takes us to unexpected places as artists or activists, uh, and then we have to begin to navigate other questions you know, I just wanted to follow up on that, Ricardo, because I think that's really, that's exactly what it does happen. And I think that the, the trick is then, once you've gotten to that space, reflect upon this is where we are now and this is what our work has done. And where do we go from here? That is, and then what? Um, and so I, I always like to think of one of the things I think artists can learn from activists is that activists plan in terms of campaigns. That is, they don't just do a tactic and then walk away and hope something happens. They do a tactic that leads to an objective, and then if they obtain that objective, they do another tactic. Often they don't obtain that objective, but they obtain another objective, and then they look at that and then plan from there. And activist history is full of examples like that. And I think art history is as well. And, and, and this is why I think it's important in, in relationship to electronic disturbance theater uh, is uh, this kind of a durational aspect of a gesture. Um, that is, uh, often the gestures are repeated, a blind probing of the social space. Uh, that is, the response by Congress or my own institution or the activists each create a different effective space and affective space, right? Um, and use, so... You have to use my word. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 I was using it before you. I patented those, and I'm going to sue you for it. Uh, so. Uh, but again, one has to sort of improvise within that performative matrix in that the affect effect condition of the FBI is might be different in its constitution, in its utopian thinking versus the activists or say the hacker, right, or the zapatistas. And each of those, I think uh, an artist has to try to both understand over a certain period of time navigate, improvise, and then think, well, what element of that blind probing can we amplify in this particular uh, gesture, in this particular occurrence? Let me ask you about sort of press and media and how that plays in. For, I would say, in the world of activism straight up, uh, without necessarily an artistic dimension to it, 
it, it really is center stage. It's whether you can get attention, how many eyeballs you can draw, what kind of mainstream media visibility you get, what sort of play and resonance uh, your statement, press release, op-ed, uh, testimony has, uh, you know, across social media, how many impressions. And so it, it's almost become, with, with sort of demonstrations and protests, the visuals and the apparatus and the projections and the light brigade is all about getting the photo and the snapshot and the video that will then play and resonate. And it, it, it comes to feel somewhat formulaic. And I'm wondering how that plays out for, for art. Are you sort of sucked into the same vortex of necessity Ooh. to be seen or feel like you have an impact? I, I think, unfortunately, yes. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we often think about the impact of our gestures in terms of media coverage. Um, the problem with that, and there's a certain logic to it, which is often the issues that we want to uh, bring to people's attention are hidden. And so we want to bring them out into the light, create awareness, start a dialogue, so on and so forth. The problem is, do we really just want to start a dialogue? Do we really just want awareness? Or actually, is it awareness for what? A dialogue for what? And so one of the things I'm very interested in is, again, thinking in terms of we do something for X objective, but is that actually our goal? Or is that an objective, a means to a greater end? And I think the problem is, is there's often, and this isn't just for artists, it's also for activists, is a conflation of means to ends. And the media is a means. Well, I, I to uh, a great degree, I, I agree with um, uh, the analysis in terms of being sucked into the vacuum of the media as, as kind of the measure of what a disturbance uh, manifest. Um, but I, I think one of the elements that I think is important in terms of artivism is this question of where does art reside in potentials uh, of either shifting things, um, amplifying activist concerns, or you know, creating new laws, is that art is often placed in the back pages. Mm, media is often uh, new technologies in the back pages. Important things are in the front page. Um, and so one of the things that has occurred in terms of the gestures we have done is that we are able then to speak about what art has to say about this particular issue, co-equal with the congressman, co-equal with the activists, co-equal with all the other kind of layers of authority that have that front page. And the art isn't about, I just sold it for several million dollars, which is probably the only time art actually appears in the front page. Uh, artists don't often have a chance to do an op-ed in, co in, 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 in contestation to a senator. Uh, who doesn't like your work. Uh, but we've had that ability. So while you, there has to be an awareness in artivism and activism of being sucked into the vacuum of the media as the only metric, I think what's important is to, uh, in artivism, to have art speak in a kind of co-poesis or co-equal level uh, with those voices that have the authority and often have the main page as the kind of space to speak. Yeah, no, you're reminding me of uh, at Penn American Center, we did a survey on NSA surveillance uh, asking writers how their creativity w was affected and we documented very high levels of self-censorship as a result of NSA surveillance, we put it together as a report, and we were very pleased because the New York Times decided they would uh, run it as an exclusive, and we couldn't have been happier, but then we heard it was going to run on the books page, and it was, uh, you know, just that sense of, you know, that's the convert, that's where you'd maybe expect to see that conversation happening, but we wanted to be part of the larger conversation. I think we were to a degree, but we were also relegated to a degree, and it's hard to break out of that. Can I just add to one, which brings us to what Ricardo said, is that, Ricardo, you've been very good at actually using that space of the back page in order to shift the terrain. Um, we were working with a bunch of activist artists in Russia, for example, and I've, I've met with a number of activist artists from China who actually use the insignificance of art 
as a way to actually create a space where they can actually hold protests. Everybody understands it's a protest, but since it becomes labeled as art, they're actually not persecuted for the political, um, the, the uh, you know, violating a protest law. Well, I mean, uh, we're often accused of using art as camouflage, uh, but they're wrong. Uh, we are artists, um, poets, um, we think about art, we present in museums, galleries. Um, so I, I often think that that code switch of the insignificance of art is important uh, in, in a number of spaces in order to survive as activists. Um, but since I'm a citizen of empire, uh, I have the kind of space to speak transparently as, as an artist within the questions of what is interesting to us in new media aesthetics. Um, and that it should be at the front page, if at all possible, in terms of that dialogue and not be uh, placed there. But we are aware that there are many places on the planet where that kind of code switching is extremely important and, and things couldn't be done without that sort of gesture. All right, I have one last question, then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. And it's about the electronic disturbances in sort of the world of activism, not artivism, the emergence of electronic media has been, I, I think, a great boon, but also uh, posed its own challenges. You can reach so many more people far more easily. It's such a low threshold to get somebody to just kind of hit send on your petition. Uh, you can generate tens of thousands of emails overnight, and there was no way of doing that uh, before we had digital media. At the same time, you know, nobody's ever going to remember the moment they hit send the way they remember, you know, going out on the streets and in front of the embassy uh, with a banner chanting and shouting with thousands of other people and the intensity of that kind of experience and how it shapes your ideology and your values. And I think it's a real dilemma uh, in terms of how to take advantage of these tools but also surmount some of their limitations. How, how does that play out in the world, world of, of, of artivism? That's your coinage that I'm gonna take away from this. Uh, well, I, I don't own that word. Somebody else does, but they let me borrow it today. Um, well, I think this, one of the early things for Critical Art Ensemble was this performative matrix between data bodies and real bodies that was to come, right? We imagined it coming in, in the 90s and that it was going to be extremely important to establish some sort of relationship, what we decided radical transparency would be the way to layer that, right? So the, 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 the sense, or to use Stephen's calculus, was that they may not remember having joined a virtual sit-in, but they might have a remembrance of a notion of electronic civil disobedience as a potential space of encounter, uh, which is somewhat different than a petition or an email. Right, so uh, it's, it's more about uh, allowing a certain conceptual form to play out. But one of the things that also became very apparent with the Zapatistas and has evolved is that uh, there is an, a, a deep grain being established through new media in which this radical transparency, which the NSA love, between the body in protest and its electronic manifestation. For instance, at uh, UCSD, uh, 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 when we did the protest in 2009 uh, nationally and, and, and statewide against the defunding of a public university, many of my students were using uh, cell phones, smartphones, to do the virtual sit-in. So there you started seeing a deeper integration between data body and real body, wherein they were protesting in the street and they were doing a digital action. So I think we, we can imagine the performative matrix expanding that sort of intimate encounter, wherein there isn't a, a, a kind of division between your data body and real body, uh, especially in the case of, of protest. Okay, we have mics uh, at the front of the room, and I'm gonna ask uh, that you come up if you have a question and identify yourself, and you can direct your question to either one of our speakers or, or to both. 
please. Hi. My name is Michelle Cammy. I'm a, the author of a recent book de that deals with some of these issues. It's called Who Says That's Art? And I have a, a two-part question. One is, um, at what point or how do you de determine whether something is simply a political gesture by people? It, it, re it relates to what you said a little while ago, Stephen. Uh, is, is simply a political gesture by people calling themselves artists, or is it really art? And the other is, do you think there might be a danger in reducing complex social and political issues uh, to dealing with them through a primarily emotional lens? Does it, does it perhaps pose certain real risks for, for the culture and for uh, for responsible political debate. Um, I, I'm going to answer the second question first and then see what Ricardo, because I think that's the most profound question to be asked about um, when art and politics mix. Um, and not to shut down the conversation, but I, maybe to open it up, um, I want to suggest that the most successful artistic activists of the past hundred years are the Nazi party. Um, because they were able to mobilize desire, mobilize fear, use signs, symbols, style, um, everything in the arsenal of an artistic activist to transform a society and then maintain hegemony. Um, and it was a politics of feeling. It was a politics of emotion, a politics of memory, not a politics of reason. With disastrous effects. With absolutely disastrous results. So there's two ways to look at that. One is to say it has been used for disastrous uh, results, and so therefore we should never touch it. But I think that means we deed too much terrain to our enemies. What I would rather say is that we need to constantly, constantly be asking the ethical question at all moments, which is, this may be effective, but does it fall in line with the politics that we want to bring into being? So that's the large answer. The smaller answer about the politics of reason versus the politics of emotion. I'm a fan of the politics of reason, but the fact is, is we need to convince people, we need to move people to the place where they want to read, where they want to analyze, where they want to think things through. It's not self-evident, and it won't happen by itself. That is, the truth matters, but we need to move people to care about the truth. Well, I was going to say, uh, for me, uh, one of the most important moments in, in artivism was ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. That is, we could code switch uh, between strategic reason, that is, we could look at the epistemology of the therapeutic state, say, you know, AZT is not working, it's killing more people, we need a different approach. Uh, we could uh, uh, see how to mobilize uh, human resources, government policies. But at the same time, we were, des uh, we were designing questions about uh, uh, passion, uh, alternative forms of love, uh, kiss-ins, butt-ins, right? Things that would excite people and, and, and mobilize them. So I think to separate uh, both kind of the uh, conditions of the politics of reason from the politics of emotion to amplify each other are extremely uh, important and um, not always, the, uh, how shall I say, uh, the Nazis as the su successful uh, entities, but groups like ACT UP. The other group, say, that is important to me are the Zapatistas. The Zapatistas have a very coherent a strategic uh, issue about self-governance, the establishment of indigenous rule uh, against uh, uh, a government and governments, if you include NAFTA, that want to delete them from existence. Yet at the same time, they respond to these government uh, dictates through poetics. Uh, stories about uh, one-legged chickens, Pedrito, a two and a half year at the whole Labal with uh, Mayan technology. Uh, they use pornography, they use um, uh, uh, children's stories. Uh, they create performances uh, to create a, a, a mobilization of feeling as well. So I, I think what's important is not to do a, a, a kind of forensic cut of the body, but that the cut of the real is, uh, uh, again, uh, a suturing of both types of conditions. Um, 
Next question. Hi, um, I'm Lorraine Morales Cox. I teach at Union College. I'm associate professor of visual arts, and I just want to thank the organizers for this amazing conference. This is really great. Um, I just taught a course um, on environmentalism and contemporary art, um, and I had approval from the environmental studies program. I had 20 students. I'm sorry. I had I taught a course on environmentalism and contemporary art, and I had 21 students. Only four are visual art majors. I had environmental studies students. I had geologists, biologists, and because you mentioned, you know, bringing activism to the artist, but also bringing the, um, the activist to the art going both ways. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, beyond, I think it's Richard Heldago who wrote the book um, Education for a Socially Engaged Art in terms of like a studio practice, but what's happening as in, in higher ed in terms of bringing these creative artistic strategies toolboxes to these, you know, political science students and to, you know, the people who really want to be activists because what these students were amazed by, they were like, I never knew that creativity and art could be a game changer. And it really sort of opened their eyes up and, and I'm, I'm hoping it's, it was the first time I did it, it was, they had team projects, they had to do their own creative intervention on the campus. So it wasn't just me showing them all these artists, you know, one sort of was very inspired by the Yes Men and, you know, they, they really, loved it and they really they worked they had to collaborate they had to learn how to brainstorm so i'm wondering you know maybe someone in the audience or what's happening in um arts at you know bringing these things across the curriculum and it's, it's an effort that i'm trying to, to be involved with and so any more sort of thanks. tips of what's happening thanks oh uh, well at a basic level i i i'm, I'm a professor at, at ucsd so i spend a lot of time uh, doing classes that focus on questions of artivism, um, and new forms of um, gestures using uh, technology, uh, using uh, focused questions like climate change. And uh, because I'm, I'm also a principal investigator at this transdisciplinary institute uh, of scientists, engineers, and, and artists, I'm able to bring in that kind of community into the conversation. Um, and, and so uh, it's sort of a privileged point in terms of pedagogy, at least for me, to be able to um, create a circuit. Now, uh, often sometimes one has to um, create a, a type of environment where certain forms of knowledge don't overcome other forms of knowledge. And so sort of negotiating a, a, a kind of a flat, ontology of sharing or uh, what is it uh, sharing ignorance rather than or the politics of the question rather than the politics of the answer and knowledge so that's a, often a good base uh, and I'll, I'll just finish here. For instance, one of the things that we began to investigate was that UCSD it produces a great deal of the infrastructure for unmanned aerial vehicles that are being used worldwide to kill people, right? The Predator, a Homeland Security uses for border uh, um, um, enforcement, uh, yet many of our engineers and scientists and artists, faculty and students didn't know about this relationship, which for many is sort of, sure, there's a relationship between military research and a university. So we did a year-long investigation called Drones at Home, where we began to ask uh, our, those people who are making these things and our students to begin to look at how drones function within our own university. Where are the little bits and pieces of research that are being built? Uh, who is building them? How do they think about it? And so we were able then to create uh, gestures by engineers, scientists, uh, students uh, that would point to these spaces to develop other ways to uh, create cognitive maps of awareness of what it means to be in a university that produces this kind of uh, drone culture, if you will. Uh, so again, a year-long investigation, conversations on multiple scales, uh, I think is probably uh, one of the privileges of being uh, where I'm at. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think universities are the most nimble of institutions. Um, uh, but I do think there is uh, increasing recognition, both from the activist side and the artist side and the scientist side, um, of understanding that each one has something which they can add to the equation. Um, it's now common to have interdisciplinarity be part of university education. Um, I see in another four or five years this sort of interchange which you're creating in your classroom. 
um, as much more common. Uh, just over at NYU, we have the Yes Labs, there's Hemispheric Institute, my center, what have you, all who do this sort of pairing of people that are in the arts or people in the social sciences and sometimes the sciences. And I think we're going to see more of it simply because it works and it will develop and we need to work through the problems that Ricardo poses. Yeah, and just a word from sort of the NGO world. I think there it's become, certain aspects of it have become absolutely central. Getting the right image, the right video that will mobilize has become an, an indispensable part of, of pretty much any, any campaign. And then, you know, to some degree kind of thinking beyond that about how to uh, expand the toolbox because the things you have aren't, aren't working well enough. Please. Hi. Um, so my name is Misha Saunders. Uh, I was active in the Occupy movement. I'm now at a painting school upstate called Free Columbia. It's an art and social change school. And it's funny for me when we're talking about these things because I guess one of the biggest experiences I, I've had through activism is um, the, we're, what, we're, what you were calling the aesthetic of efficiency comes in very strongly, and definitely in activism these days, the uh, aesthetic of hyperactivity. Uh, you know what? The way that we're going to really change things is by making this as big and explosive as absolutely possible. And that's great. Uh, I like big and exciting things. Um, but going to this point that you made about uh, thinking all the way down the road, thinking to the dream, and then working back from there, and looking at the aesthetic as uh, particularly of hyperactivity, but also of efficiency, as where are those aesthetics taking us? And particularly because you said you're an educator and I guess you get to travel a whole bunch and those kinds of cool things, are there aesthetics that you're seeing that you think actually need to be brought to the forefront which might not look as flashy, but are maybe leading more to where your dreams lead as far as art and activism? Sure. I'm going to do a little plug for Actopedia.org. It's a user-generated database of creative activism examples from around the world. And I'd say most of the examples, and there's almost a thousand examples, um, and hopefully after this forum, there'll be a thousand and fifteen or twenty. Um, most of them aren't big and flashy, but are small gestures. And I'm just going to point to Ricardo for a second, okay? Because I think one of the beauties of the, his, the transporter immigration tool was the small gesture of the poem that would come up. Um, and that, that sort of the, the, the beauty of it, that sort of small private moment in which the humanity of people are recognized and that they're not just workers crossing a border but people engaged in a larger thing, those I think can be as effective as a large scale spectacle and very importantly those large scale spectacles, those large demonstrations take an immense amount of effort and activity and lead to a lot of burnout. Um, and so there's, you know, if you want to think about efficacy or efficacy, um, we have to think about are there these small gestures, sitting down on a bus, okay, sitting at a lunch counter, which can be as effective as these massive demonstrations. Well, that's why I started off with micro gestures uh, that are shareable and small, um, but also durational. Um, because often we're overwhelmed by the tactical needs or strategic needs. And um, so the, the kind of um, uh, sense of creating unexpected beauty, for lack of a, of a better uh, way to say it, um, is, is also important to participate in. And often that might be to exit uh, the core situation for a while in order just to think things out. Uh, I, I mean, it's hard for my students when I say, well, think 10 years, right, between what you imagine constructing it, thinking about it, right? Uh, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to hang out with all these hippies, and most of the hippies were anthropologists for some reason. Uh, and I remember them telling us that it takes 10 years to understand anything. So it takes about three to four years for your body to understand the atmosphere, right? Is it a, what does it mean, the clouds in this space? It takes about another three, four years for you to understand the mood of a community. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they activated? Then it takes another two or three years for you to understand yourself within that space and then begin to sort of uh, 
move it or uh, manifest it in certain, a certain way. And I think that's a, a type of aesthetic, right? Uh, small gestures, uh, unexpected beauty, long-term durational process, uh, I think are important in kind of the hyperactivity and, and the call of the spectacle. And just to, the idea of duration doesn't mean that you're not doing anything during that duration. That is one of the exercises we do when we go places is we brainstorm, plan, and execute an action in 24 hours, including building all of the props and building you know everything. And the idea there is it's going to fail. It's definitely going to fail. But it's actually the idea of not thinking that we have to put everything into every moment, but instead experimentation. It's an iteration, it's a sketch, we like to say. And so you can have that, that sort of frenetic energy, but not think that it's all gonna come together. But instead, it's a sketch which is gonna lead to another sketch, which then maybe 10 years down the line moves, leads to a masterpiece, which is gonna look very different than that preliminary sketch. Well, I think it was Samuel Beckett who said, uh, our, an artist's job is to fail better every time. Okay, we have time for just one more question. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, the professor's point before. Sorry, I'm bad at public speaking. Um, but uh, the methodology you were speaking about is something I just graduated from a course that was, instead of doing the activism side, it was kind of more pr promoting creativity and design to promote government agendas and that kind of um, using these kind of tools to you know, inflict paradigm shifts in public policy for health and how to do that kind of thing. And so I was kind of, it's the interdisciplinary of using social sciences with design and kind of moving that agenda forward. And the kind of shortfalling of the program was that we never got this activist side. So I was wondering if like the activist side has kind of the government kind of paternalism qualities to it. I don't know if the question's clear, but I'm going to take moderator's prerogative to sort of add, add something to that that came to mind for me when uh, the, the point was raised about the Nazi party, which is to what extent do you think role comes in here? I mean, one point you might think of is that, you know, it's not the role of a government or a political party to seek to strike at this deep emotional level and use artistic tools to change minds and, and ideologies, you know, that that's perfectly appropriate for an artist from where they sit, but that the role of government is to, you know, sort and weigh between different stakeholders and, uh, you know, not to appeal perhaps at that level. Do you, do you accept that? And maybe building on, on her question uh, as well of how these things ought to intersect. I, I think there's a difference between theory and practice, which is, I think, what you're, th you're saying. Is I think, in theory, democratic theory says you're absolutely right. In practice, no lasting government has ever worked that way. Um, but then we have to think about, well, who does it ethically and who doesn't do it ethically? I think we can all agree that the Nazi party probably did not, right? Or at least not according to our ethics. But I'm very interested in how the state can mobilize art and do it in such a way as not to make people just feel and follow, but to think and analyze. And my go-to example would be the New Deal. As I actually think during the New Deal, there was all of this sort of flowering of arts in support of the state, but in such a way as they addressed people not just as an audience, but also as participants. Not just as people who couldn't think and must follow, but people that were reasoning beings and could follow logic. And you know, uh, my example would be, very quickly, um, FDR's fireside chats. If, has anybody listened to FDR's fireside chats? One should. They're amazing. They're moving. They are. Uh, they're inspiring. They're comforting. And within eight minutes, he lays out how banking works in the United States. Cold, hard facts about banking. That is, and it goes back to what um, Ricardo's talking about. It doesn't need to be an either-or proposition. Because if it's all emotion, then we are talking about a politics of unreason. But if it's all about reason, we're not talking about politics at all because those people are never going to be in power. Um, well, you know, one of the things is that um, uh, we sort of code switch in terms of this question of uh, governance having an aesthetic core, right, as sort of a, its mainstay. Uh, which I, I think they, they often uh, do uh, in terms of 
promoting their party or their politics or images in the media. But one of the things that I, I think we learned from a, a cultural theorist, uh, Mary Pat Brady, um, was that she, uh, in an essay in 2008 called The Homoerotics of the U.S. Border, uh, said that the border was an aesthetic project between two nation states, which themselves are an aesthetic romance, right? So that really allowed us then to change the way we were approaching the transborder immigrant tool, not to think of the border as a site of a killing governance, but as land dart. So that then our tool participated in shifting the aesthetics of that land dart, uh, wherein an activist might say, well, here is a hard border, a killing border, uh, you know, what can we do with it? We can't move it, we can't mobilize it. It keeps getting amplified in terms of its military hardware and funding. But if we then kind of see it as a more um, uh, of a different grain, right? If it's land art, then something else can begin to happen around it, a different conversation, a different sensibility. So that is uh, uh, accepting that governance carries with it uh, an aesthetic, which is and both, affect and effect. Uh, but if we see that governance has an aesthetic, then one can begin to disturb that aesthetic, uh, rearrange it, whereas governance and laws, you know, are a little bit different in, in terms of their malleability as texture, as canvas, as, as pigment. Um, so uh, then the border patrol become uh, actors in a performance as opposed to border patrol. Uh, uh, the homeland security uh, becomes just another actant within a larger performative matrix. So when they come knocking at my door, uh, it's not, oh, you know, here's the law, uh, but here is somebody who perhaps in a utopian sense is looking for not law, but justice. And that's a different sort of uh, code switch that happens, at least in, in, in the way we've been thinking. We'll probably debate the effectiveness as our, of art as activism uh, for, for a long time to come, but I don't think there's, there's much debate that thinking about activism sort of through the lens of art makes it much more imaginative and interesting. And I personally, for that reason, have really enjoyed this conversation. I really want to thank uh, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.